Welcome to Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle, coming up on the programme this week. These routines and these rituals, you can say, that I used to do and have in place, in my mind, if I didn't do that, I knew inside me that the worst could happen and it will happen. For you, was that a d- direct comparison? I am looking at the bodies of other people and I'm thinking, do I look like that? It was straightforward as that online social media was at my fingertips, especially when I was in my early 20s. A wide range of resources and and websites to look at and compare. And I'll be reminding you how you can make connections with mental health organisations within your community. It's Mental Health Monday. The home of the UK's conversation about mental health. I do hope you are well. Thank you so much for downloading and streaming Mental Health Monday. It's always a pleasure to share our stories with you i hope you're doing well as well this going out uh, mid-december 2022 so much going on at the moment um apart from in the temperature gauge because it is staying low 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 it has been cold 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 for quite a few days now so i hope things are working out for you i don't know about you but you know i feel guilty just at whenever you hear the heating kick in you think oh it's costing me money this uh, and then you realize that yeah Absolutely. You need to look after yourself. And part of that um, is warming your home, staying warm, finding places to stay warm as well. So I hope that's working out for you. On the program this week, what a brilliant guest we have got for you. Sandeep Saib is our guest. Now, Sandeep, I have followed on social media uh, for many, many years. And I've always been aware of the various different events that she's been part of, the great opportunities that she's taken up from sharing her experience and then being asked to share her experience more widely to encourage uh, greater, wider conversations around mental health and to explore some of the specifics in terms of her own story as well. And Sandeep does that so, so well, to the point where I was certain that I'd met her at something or an event or something, and we couldn't quite work out where it was. But we certainly had plenty to talk about when we caught up for this week's podcast. So 10 years ago, Sandeep was diagnosed with anorexia and body dysmorphia disorder and OCD. She's going to talk about that experience as part of the podcast today. She's also a suicide survivor and we'll talk about suicidal thoughts as well. So we are going to touch on those issues as part of the podcast this week. She does it in a way which I hope people will find inclusive and uh, she certainly does it in a responsible way. Like I say, Sandeep has got such experience now about talking about her story, sharing her story, that I hope that you find the language that she uses helpful in maybe explaining some of your own feelings or the feelings of people around you. And maybe also that you might get a sense that, yeah, absolutely, you can be going through dark times, but there are better times ahead and better things can come from these dark, dark situations. I started off by talking to Sandeep about the experience and journey that she was on now, traveling around sharing her story, getting involved in all these different types of events when she considers where she was when she first got that diagnosis 10 years ago. Very strange. Uh, to be honest with you, just to, it's, I'm, I'm truly in awe in terms of how, how many opportunities I've had the honour to be a part of and support and so many causes. Back to, um, you know, if I, I take my mind back to 20, 2012, where my mental health first started, Um, being diagnosed with anorexia nervosa, body dysmorphia disorder, OCD, and and being a suicide survivor in August 2014, that's where I thought my world stopped. And it all changed for me, I think, post-2016. And since then, just, yeah, like I said, just been truly in awe in the amount of opportunities that came my way. And mental health advocacy work is my form of therapy. It definitely keeps me... Um, level-headed and to help and inspire others is just definitely what I live for and it's priceless priceless helping helping others as much as I can if you're comfortable Sandeep we'll sort of take you back to sort of well where that journey begins if you like you mentioned 2012 there was it did it start with diagnosis was it or were there other behaviors before then that you now recognize as being problematic that maybe foreshadow things that were to come in the in the near future Mm. Um, I think one um, one key aspect, if I remember back in 2012, was when we moved houses as a family. And um, I just wanted to get involved in something and do something active. 
And that's where the idea of running, jogging um, came into mind. And it started off something that became a hobby, but it spiraled out of control quite quickly and quite rapidly. And it was a rigorous two years of doing exercising where it controlled me rather than me controlling the exercising. And it just went to all different lengths. Um, I started to do, started to, you know, have controlling behaviors and um, coping mechanisms, things like keeping weight diaries, keeping food diaries down to a T, comparing myself more so um, to others and having that notion of whatever I did just wasn't good enough. And I always strived and I still strive with the mentality of trying to be perfect. And I say that like that because it doesn't exist. And I learned that through therapy and counseling. And another aspect um, is the fact that with the, the thinking I had with my eating and the way I looked really stemmed, I think, from my childhood. It's one of those things where it was always, it was all there, always in there in my mind. And, and that's how I felt since I was four or five years old and I'm 33 now. So it has always played that prevalent role in my mind. And there was a lot of peak and troughs. And I think if I look back, 2012 was definitely the turning point when I moved houses and when I started this exercising. If, 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 I mean, I've, I've advocated many times on this program about sort of the, the value mm. of, of exercise. Um, and maybe in your own mind, you were thinking, you know, that was something that it was going to be a positive in your life. Um, what, yeah, what, what, what were those signs and what were those um, moments for you that, that, that maybe gave you a clue that, that the balance had shifted, that something which had been designed to be something positive was actually opening up something which was much more negative? Mm, anger outbursts very severe anger outbursts, withdrawal, not going to, you know, family functions, socializing after work with colleagues. I used to, um, you know, not eat at all and starving my body, weighing myself, taking the scales out every evening at the end of the day, wanting to see and striving to see a zero on the scale, you know, and all these unrealistic expectations that I had on myself and being severely self-critical of the way I looked. There are things where I used to do with my um, with with my body, you know, counting the number of ribs um, from left to right. You know, it was these routines and these um, uh, things that I used to do, rituals, you can say, that I used to do and have in place. Because in my mind, if I didn't do that, I feel the worst. Uh, not feel. I I knew inside me that the worst could happen and it will happen so to avoid that eventuality I used to go through that and it's a safety behavior for me it kept me safe it kept me level-headed and on top of that my parents noticed these red flags as well and it's one of those things where when they noticed and um, had that first initial chat with me to discuss that they were worried that's when I think the bubble popped and I just felt at that moment that God is something that I'm living with here, but it's having a severe impact on people around me and my support network. So this is something that's really, really a problem here that I need to sort out. And it wasn't a case of maybe, you know, in a few years time, maybe, you know, in the coming months or so, it was now, it was here right now. And it was, that's when it became a reality that I had a problem. If I when your parents sort of made that intervention, if you if you like, maybe that's not the right word, but if they if they stepped in and said, you know, let, let's yeah. have a chat about that. You mentioned the yeah. bubble pop there. I don't know if the word the, the right word is is sort of the logic. You know, the logic around something that if you wanted to whatever it would be, learn to play the piano, you'd sit down mm. and you'd play for a certain number of hours and you'd try and yeah. gradually get Oh, at what point did you notice that that logic had kind of disappeared, that those behaviors didn't fit in with something which uh, you know somebody who wanted to get fit for instance or somebody who wanted to have a healthy body at what point were you aware that that logic had kind of gone out the window and actually those behaviors that you were showing were suggesting that there was something else going on you mentioned OCD before those sort of compulsive things again mm -hmm. wh where was that balance and, and and when did you sort of tip that balance my first doctor's appointment um, I guess that was something that I 
didn't really do for myself. I did it for my parents, just for the sheer worry that they were going through in regards to what, what I was feeling and um, going through myself. So I guess when the doctors mentioned um, and diagnosed me, I, I think that's when I realised that, you know, this something, something that I'm going through mentally actually has a name to it. Um, you know, I'm not alone, that there are other people that are going through, um, you know, similar um journeys like me and I can actually put a name to what I'm feeling and um, that's when I was referred to cognitive behavioral therapy and I think that's where I began to gain a greater insight into me who I am and challenging the um, emotions and thoughts um, you know all of them were negative but just trying to ch challenge that as much as I can so I guess the doctor's appointment and the CBT really was the start of that journey to open up um my feelings and and explore that in a bit more depth and when people talk about um eating disorders or when people talk about um um some elements of ocd that the word control often mm. sort of comes up um i want to ask you about that just in terms of your understanding of that Did, were you able to pinpoint something that you uh, wanted to control or was there an element of your life that you felt was out of control and this brought a bit of control to it you mentioned there the, the feeling of always wanting perfection was that mm. was that your way of, of quote controlling it I guess so I, I think it's um at both of those aspects really I think for me it's um it grow organically in my mind the fact that I needed to have these certain rituals in place to keep me to keep me going and to keep me safe um, you know, I never thought I'd, I'd do a weight diary. I never thought I'd, I, I'd keep a food diary or, you know, go through these stages. But I've noticed certain behaviours I did when I was a teenager. So it came back full circle um, and exasperated that bit more. So, for example, um, starving my body when I was a teenager, I think 12, 13 years old. That was the first time I took my mom's exercise videos and I started to exercise. There was a three or four day spell where um, I didn't eat anything and I starved myself. And it came back again in my early 20s. So I think it's twofold here. I think some of the behaviours I did um, already and I went through that when I was a, when I was a child, some were new behaviours that grew organically. And, and others, I guess, it's just the external factors. So social media, um, comparing myself um, to others and my, and my peers at work and things like that. So it's a lot of childhood, internal and external feelings. When people talk about, um, they used to talk about uh, magazines, but it's obviously moved on to yeah. social media now, that comparison. For you, was that a direct comparison? I am looking at the bodies of other people and I'm thinking, do I look like that? Was it as straightforward yeah. as that? It was straightforward as that, you know, online, online social media was at my fingertips, especially when I was in my early 20s, my teens, it wasn't there. So I had um, had to be available a, a wide range of resources and, and websites to look at and compare, you know, the TV and things like that. So um, it was easy for me to obtain information and to absorb that and read that. I would actually go out of my way to download apps, you know, um, to Glamour magazines, to, you know, showbiz magazines and things like that. And always keep an eye and always keep in a check, refreshing constantly anything new that's coming up. Um, Instagram for me, um, I joined a couple of years ago, but it's one of those things where I took it upon myself to to know more um, about this world, um, but in, in, in the negative way, in a negative way to to extent of taking all um all that on board such as the body and things like that and eating as, as an adult um sorry as an adult in your 30s now compared to someone who was sort of new to mm -hmm. social media um how do you view the sort of posts now that you see about people who are presenting themselves as looking a certain way um I have to have this conversation with my children who see mm -hmm. things on the internet I have to kind of, yeah I, the starting point I have is nothing you see is really real. Like I have to say, I, I, I almost have that as a starting point. Um, mm. But of course, when you're younger, you don't have those those filters. It's sort of direct, isn't it? That's the person and that's what they, they mm. look like as well. Are you able now, as you're older, to kind of go, 
oh, that person, you can even see the way they've sort of put their body to look a certain way. There's a strong chance that they've got an editing team behind them. This this picture and this photo has been stylized out by crews of people and it's been lit a certain way. Um, do you see through that stuff now? I do. I do. And I just wish that I had this mentality earlier on in my life. I wish there were safeguarding rules and, you know, and, and things like that. And person, bearing in mind, we didn't have technology like to the extent we have now um, back, back when I was um, uh, young. So I guess there is so much more um, that needs to be done in terms of um, media and, um, you know, magazines, glamour magazines and social media. I think they need to be, there's, there needs to be more joined up approach in communicating to one another and all these organizations are responsible to make sure that they are putting out content there that are, that are positive and um, body positive and, and words of encouragement. And we are slowly seeing, seeing a shift here. And um, I've actually had the honor to share my story and as a person of color for the likes of Glamour Magazine and Cosmopolitan. So they are making headways. Um, so ripples are being made, um, but there's a lot more that can be done. And I guess the best way to counteract anything like that that you do see is positive affirmations, is sharing your story in a positive light or resharing other positive um, you know, articles and blogs and advocates and their work. That's the best way, I think, to make noise, but make noise in a positive way to counteract what you see and what you're hearing in, in for example, the social media side of things. That was a very good answer to a slightly clumsy question for me. But the reason I was asking it was, and, and you've answered it within the question, was was, <laughs> was around what, what do we need to have in that space? Because I get the sense that the world of the quote, fake photo, the mm. impossibly glamorous, oh, look at me, I'm in Dubai for the eighth time this year, photo. Mm. They're not going away. And if anything, there'll mm. be more of those yeah. photos to come. But actually what you touched on there was not to say, let's have less of those photos. It was more, let's have some real photos thrown into the mix as well. So when you are in that sort of the, the doom scroll, it, you're not met with the same image over and over or same type of image over and over again. You're met with other images, which I guess tells your brain there's not one show in town here, that there are lots mm -hmm. of other stories out there. Spot on. That's exactly it, you know, and that's that's the best way. And to have um, an army, so for example, an, uh, an army of body positive advocates um, all on their individual Instagram accounts or all on their individual Twitter. Imagine the huge impact in, for example, in, in a, take for example, in a day, the amount of content that each of them push out that is positive around body images. It's going to make a huge change. That's going to be a game changer. The more they do it, the more it, it you know, maintains and retains at the top of people's minds. So the narrative starts to then slowly change. Um, if all of us work collaboratively and all of us have a responsibility, not just me, not just yourself. I think all of us have to put in that effort to change the narrative, yeah. You mentioned uh, as part of the, the, the story 2014 and a suicide mm. attempt, um, obviously dealing with what you dealt with before that was obviously a huge deal and then throw suicidal thoughts into the mix and then we're into sort of a, a whole different ballpark. Um, we, we, did the suicidal thoughts for you come once you were aware of what was going on from from an eating point of view or how did that fit into the timeline if you like so during my um you know two years of thinking about exercise and doing exercise and having that mentality i actually um do forget to mention this um key part um in my story is during those two years i um i twisted my ankle I, I was out and I had an injury and I was out for a good four months now being somebody that was that's really really um you know holds their routine with exercise to high regard and having that removed and that sense of a safety blanket removed underneath my feet I didn't know where else to turn I didn't know where to go and then add to that what I went through within the two years anyways, with my exercising, with my eating, with, um, you know, the withdrawal, feeling a huge amount of 
regret and felt like I was bird, a burden to my family, that I didn't fit in. I was abnormal no matter what I did, no matter what I said. I was always seen, seemed to be the strange one or the odd one in the family. And being a person of colour and being from a Sikh community, you're not dealing with your own family, you are dealing with extended family members as well. So it's a really closely knit community that everyone knows you, everyone knows your business and what you're up to. So there's more so added pressure from them um, name calling and misconceptions and um, you know that that shame as well and what you what you are seen in their eyes um, as well so there's a lot of that pressure then on top of that what I went through in my childhood um, being you know being the fat or seen to be the fat chubby one um, since a tender age of three four and that you know, names like that, the name calling just stuck with me since I was young to to where I am now. Um, and I guess all of that and and more just escalated. And that's where I hit my breaking point on the 29th of August 2014. Everything, not just what came before, but what came years before that all accumulated to that very day where I try to take my own life. So I, I can't attribute it ever to one particular thing, one particular um, experience in my life. Many threads, many, many threads, many, many moments. And I, I, am, I believe I am a sensitive person and I take so many of what people say to me seriously. And yeah, and, and more. So yeah, in short, a lot of, aspects of my life you know had that effect um th thank you for being so honest about that sandy really really appreciate that um and you sharing that story i guess sometimes when people think about their life journey and sort of where they are they tend to almost picture and i do this myself like a, a graph if you like and it's mm. sort of like highs and lows and i wonder yeah. whether or not if just for the sake of arguments if there was a point where it was almost like funneled into that moment of a suicide attempt that there's a moment where you push through and actually that moment of pushing through opens up eventually to the life that you lead now and the life that you want to lead and the work that you've done. But I imagine that the, from a suicide attempt to get through that to the bit where you see the, the sunlight, the bit where mm. you see the light takes a great deal of effort and energy. And I just wanted to maybe ask you if you could give us a sense of what that felt like when that came. Cause I think there are a lot of people who go through that and almost think, well, even if I make an attempt, what is on the other side of, I don't even know what's on the other side of it, but it might even be just, it might feel to some people like it's too difficult to even comprehend rebuilding their lives, which is mm. why they see the suicide is an option yet we know through the work that you've done and the conversations that we've had that there is hope there is joy there is life there's affirmation there's all of those things on the other side but that push through must be so difficult mm, absolutely it's not an easy one you know that person that is in that moment that's their plan that's their way um that they want to get out of all the pain um that they've been going through that's the only option now um, and, and the only route that um, that they want to take and they will take to some degree. But I guess the way how I push through is when I was in that mentality and what I call till this day, hearing two voices, conflicting voices in my mind, the angel and the devil, you know, the angel saying, you need to be here, Sandy, you need to live, you need to live for your family. And the the devil voice saying you know you're not worthy to be on this world you know you've neglected your family you will do that again I guess what broke those voices down and what felt like forever you know I know it was only a few minutes but it felt like forever going through that thought process with tears streaming down my eyes my mum was was the person that saved me hearing her voice became louder in my mind um, and she was adamant. She she was adamant to get me out of that um, that that thought, that thought process. 
And I started to listen to her more. And that's where I started to stop what I'm doing and, you know, compose myself and then um, let, her, let her in. And I guess there was, there was no words at that, at that very moment. You know, we immediately as a family decided that we need to crack on with private therapy. I was actually on the waiting list for the NHS secondary psychological um, care, but it was, it was a matter of, I need the help now, you know? And I guess even in that moment, I, I, I had to do what I had to do with the support of my family. I didn't even think about, you know, what would the other people say in my family, you know, the, the shame and anything like that. I think in that mentality, I knew that this was absolutely wrong. What I tried to do, I felt this immense regret. And I felt that I had that responsibility to turn it around, but I didn't know how. And that's where I, that's where my parents helped. And that's where private therapy came. And I thought, okay, this is something that I'm going to, I'm going to try and give it a go. Um, and then the more I tried that, it gave me a bit of that hope, that glimmer of hope, that insight that things can get better and things can look a bit brighter and the grass can be greener on the other side, but you've got to try it. You've got to give it a go and you've got to give it a good go, not just a day or a week but really commit yourself. And it's not an easy commitment. It's not an easy commitment to make. And it's hard, like you said, to, to, to see a way out, you know, when you are so, when you are so, you know, tunnel vision in your thinking, you need to let that bubble pop, you know, you need to let someone in, something in to help you and, and, and take you out of that, of that darkness. So yeah a huge commitment it's a challenge it's not easy but you've got to start somewhere and it's so important that you do and that's another thing I want to also stress is stress is having having options available to a person you know they are not a, a person is never you know um, defined by their diagnosis you need to look at the human and provide personalized care and treatment for them you know it's not one size fits all and I think that I definitely want to stress that, you know, different things work for different people and you've got to approach it very sensitively. And that's where you've got to listen, proactively listen um, and listen again um, at every moment you get to really understand that person. Where are they at in their life? What do they need and how can I help uh, best help them or and or provide them with the best options? Um, but yeah, in short, there is hope. You've just got to stay committed, stay level grounded and be open, um, you know, to to the world around you and the beauty around you. And when, when we talk about uh, stigma around mental health, there's a, the word, uh, particularly when we talk mm. about suicide, the word selfish gets, oh, it's self, oh, selfish decision, mm. someone said, oh, it's a selfish thing to do. Um, but actually what you've just described there is, is a slightly different meaning of the word selfish which i've kind of come to use a little bit more when around the world of of mental health which is you've got to be selfish like you've got to when you describe what you've gone through that you have to think right what's here for me now what do i need to do hmm. what is that and actually you you have to back yourself you have to make a commitment to that and that it, hmm. it, it's that's not the that's not the easy option i guess to take to suddenly if you've had feelings of wordlessness and, and not being worth to then suddenly go, no, I have to back myself here. I have to take these steps. I have to physically get through the door of a, you know, a counseling or therapy session. Yeah. And I have to take on board and be proactive with this. That, that's almost being selfish, isn't it? You have to have that, but it's not this, it's not the selfish that we, we associate. It's a, it's a, it's a much more positive way of looking at the word selfish. But on, we are our own therapists. We know ourselves better than anybody else, to be honest with you. And going back to your point earlier around, um, you know, uh, people you know, trying to end their lives, for example, they don't want to die. People don't want to die. They just want the pain to stop. And they've come to that point in their life that there is no way out, that this is what I'm going to do. This is the act I'm going to take to stop the pain and, and find, find some common ground to, um, to live with that. And I think it's hard for that person to think like that. And it's even harder for the people they leave behind as well. And when you're in that, even in just in that thinking process, that is, that is not selfish. You know, you don't go out of your way to think like that. 
That is the last thing that anyone is thinking. Anyone is thinking at that point. But you're doing what you feel is going to provide you with comfort in that very moment in time. And um, of course, it's not the right way. But in that moment, that's the only option you think you have. Um, so, yes, it's important that that bubble needs to pop um, and it pops at different stages for different people at different times. But know when it does that there are op you know options on the other side of that door. Something Sunday that I'm very keen to explore um, probably next year now as we head into the end of, of, of mm -hmm. this year. It'll be a lot to yeah. grow in between now and Christmas. We'll be around um, female suicide and female female suicide ideation because often um, mm -hmm. when we talk about suicide figures, it's the three and four are men. Uh, and yet the stats around f suicide ideation is actually higher in, in women. And I just wonder whether or not that na narratively, should we try and save as many people from suicide? Yes, absolutely. I almost feel sometimes like women, female suicide ideation takes the back seat because it's lesser numbers. Um, but quite clearly, the ideation issue suggests that women are experiencing that pain and living through that pain and continuing to live with that pain. They're just not showing up on the next set of stats, which yeah. are people who've died by by suicide. And I wonder whether or not that, that that's something which we need to maybe get to grips with as a society, as opposed to thinking, well, it's, at least women aren't dying by suicide. But if they're getting to that point and they're attempting it, then there is still a major problem here. Absolutely. Early intervention and prevention is key. You know, you've got to think about suicide as a whole. So people that are um, that have suicide ideations, that have made attempts, that have, you know, um, people that have died by suicide and those that are bereaved by suicide. So you've got to look at the overall um, process, I guess, the overall world of suicide. And they're all interlinked and interconnected. So it's important for us to look at it as its entirety, you know, to make sense of it. Um, and I and I don't think that b by ignoring suicide ideation will get anywhere. You need to include that. Um, there's no point in saying that you know nothing has happened to women. Um, you know, no, no, not many women have you know tried to take their own lives, um, but they're thinking about it. It's that thinking, that that initial thinking. That's where you need to get them. That's where you need to support them. That's a, um, a indirect cry for help. You know, those are the pivotal moments really where you start to see the red flags. So early intervention to prevent it, absolutely paramount, absolutely paramount. So not one, not one to ignore at all. And in terms of your your journey, now that you sort of travel around speaking at these events and people sort of hear your story, they will say to you, "What do we need, Sandy? What what's the what's the magic what's the magic bullet, if you like?" Um, you start shaking mm. your head there now in a, in a way. So many, goes, so many. <laughs> there's, there's so much to get into, and I think the the answer is it won't ever be just one thing, but it will undoubtedly be a combination of things because of course so many people are, are so far into journeys at different stages that that any intervention would never be the same and all people are are different as well what are those things that you've learned that really stand out as if we had this then we'd be in a better place oh mick i think we need a second <laughs> there's so many so so many um you know uh, yeah, so many, but some that come to mind whilst we're speaking is number one, to have a person that looks like me in healthcare profession, you know, in the healthcare domain. When I was looking for therapists and counsellors, I would have loved for that person to be a person of colour, for that person to have, um, you know, that experience underneath their belt, yes, that's absolutely key, but then also have that um, connection with me in terms of my culture and my identity. So I know, and they know that they know where I was coming from and it provided more of a rounded character that's sitting in front of them. Um, and I didn't have to go into depth um, from that side of things and to just get on straight in trying to resolve my thinking and emotions and what I'm feeling. That's number one. 
to see more of that. Um, number two, have it as part of the educational curriculum. I know so many, so many people have echoed this, so many advocates and possibly yourself, Mick, that you know, you've echoed. We need to have this on the curriculum in schools. Why, why isn't it on there now is beyond me. It really is. We have physical education, you know, we have other, you know, key sort of academic um, subjects that we're doing, but mental health needs to be taught um, at, a, at a very young age. And um, it's so important for us, especially when we're developing um, and growing up into a world like this. We need to know how to deal with our emotions and, and our thoughts um, that bit better. You know, the more we're aware of it, the better we can manage it. So having a well-being toolkit in school, for example, and being educated, educated on our health and well-being, definitely. I wish that was there when I was um, studying. Um, a couple of other things. <laughs> <laughs> One more thing, actually, because um, there's so many other things, uh, so many things that we can touch on, Mick. Um, but the last but not least, to have more advocates, to have more people coming out, voicing and sharing their story when it's comfortable and when it's right for them. You know, to make use of um, any platform or find a platform or be the platform to to share their story as much as they can to help and inspire others um, and talk it out as much as they can. But yeah, many more, but those are the key ones that come to my mind. Yeah, we well, that's a good, that's a New Year's resolutions for us there, Sandeep. We can uh, yes. we can we can put them into motion. Thank you so much for your time, Sandeep. Today, I really appreciate you sort of uh, you. sharing your story uh, with us. I think you share it so eloquently um and i think you give you know a, a real sense of sort of where you're at uh, but also the journey that you're on now so i look forward to seeing what you're up to uh, next we'll get a link to your social media and the various things you're talking about online uh, in our podcast notes and thank you for joining us on mental health monday fantastic thank you very much mick i hope you've enjoyed this week's podcast thanks for checking out mental health monday my name is mick coyle you can find me on twitter at mr mick coyle you can also find me mick coyle on facebook as well don't forget if you want to speak to somebody about your mental health you can do so the samaritans uh, free to call on 116 123 you can find mental health services where you are just look for the hub of hope type in your postcode it'll find those mental health services close to you and for support in a crisis you can text shout to 85258 that's if you're experiencing a personal crisis and you're unable to cope and need support uh, shout to 85258 that's a text line do get involved in those services in an absolute emergency always remember the number to call is 999 thanks for downloading the podcast this week we'll be back next week with more mental health monday